Hello, and welcome to today's event, Integrating Oral Health into Overall Health. I am Stephen Collins, the CEO of Matter. We are a healthcare technology incubator and innovation hub built on a belief that collaboration between entrepreneurs and industry leaders is the best way to develop healthcare solutions. Our mission is to accelerate the pace of change of healthcare, and we do three things in service of our mission. First, we incubate startups. Since we launched eight years ago, we've worked with more than 800 companies that range from very early to growth stage startups, and we have a suite of services to help them at every stage of development. Our member companies have raised $5 billion to fuel their growth. Second, we work with large organizations, health systems, life sciences companies, payers, to strengthen their innovation capacity. We help them find value in emerging technology solutions, unlock the full potential of their internal innovators, and create more human-centered healthcare experiences through system-level collaborations. And third, we're a nexus for people who are passionate about healthcare innovation. We bring people together to be inspired and learn and connect with each other, and we produce a lot of programs, including large-scale events for the broader community, as well as small forums that are exclusively for our members. This is our second year working with CareQuest Innovation Partners on Smile Health, which is a first of its kind program that advances technologies to improve oral healthcare. In 2022, we released a call to action to entrepreneurs to develop solutions to make oral healthcare more accessible, equitable, and integrated into overall health. We received submissions from around the globe and ultimately worked with five incredible startups, AuraQ, AuraSDX, Sleep Architects, Snowcap Crowns, and Wide Awake VR. These companies received mentorship, curriculum, and most importantly, validation studies with industry leaders such as Colgate, Cigna, Delta Dental, and 42 North. You will hear in a few minutes from Dr. Rafat Hasina from Oris DX about the experience of participating in last year's program. We launched the 2023 Smile Health program in March with the same focus on making oral health care more accessible, equitable, and integrated into overall health care. There has again been interest from around the world, and I know many in the audience today are entrepreneurs who have come to learn more. And if you're from an established company or you're an investor, and are wondering about ways to get involved in Smile Health, there are lots of ways to do so. And you'll hear more uh, later in the program about how you can get involved too. But to kick things off, I want to introduce our uh, first two speakers. Maria Filipova is the Chief Innovation Officer at CareQuest Innovation Partners. She oversees innovation, incubation, and investment activities to develop solutions that advance oral health access, equity, and integration for underserved populations. She was previously at Anthem, where she led efforts to accelerate Anthem's transformation to a digital first enterprise. Thanks so much, Maria, for your partnership and for being part of this program today. Great to be here, Stephen. Uh, Dr. William Ginobili is, school, is the Dean of the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Uh, Dr. Ginobili is a leader in the field of periodontology and an internationally recognized scholar in oral regenerative medicine, tissue engineering, and precision medicine. His research focuses on oral and periodontal regenerative medicine, and tissue engineering, and precision medicine. Thank you so much, Dr. Ginobili, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Stephen. Glad to be here uh, to join Dr. Maria Filipova as well. Um, so after we hear the comments from today's speaker, my colleague Gina Constantikopoulos will provide an overview of the 2023 Smile Health program, and we'll hear from Dr. Hasina about her company's experience with last year's program. If you have questions at any point, please use the chat feature. We will do our best to address them, and now I will turn things over to you, Maria. Thank you, Stephen, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I am so pleased to be in uh, this uh, uh, conversation again and joining this community for second year with our Smile Health 2023 program. Um, this is such a joy and a pleasure to be able to kick off the 
uh, program and also um, highlight the last week of application. So all of you who are procrastinators like myself, who like to wait until the last minute to get that extra um, in inspiration to complete your application, please do so. And hopefully today's conversation will answer some questions and clarify um, the mission of the program and the impact that we're looking to drive. I couldn't be happier to start the conversation about um, oral systemic health and the opportunities in oral systemic health with Dr. William Ginobili. He is, as Stephen mentioned, he is the 11th and newest Dean at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. And Dean Ginobili, I'm so happy that you're here with us today. So congratulations and welcome to the conversation. Um, I, I would like to perhaps kick off with um, a question that's in the back of the mind of many of our um, listeners today and many of the entrepreneurs and frankly, even the investors that we speak with. Um, at CareQuest Innovation Partners, we're focused on making oral health more accessible, equitable, and integrated for all. And when I think about uh, those three uh, characteristics, access, equity, and integration of oral and medical care. Um, many, um, you know, uh, non-insiders to oral health question whether there are truly opportunities in oral health to, to engage. Um, and so if I asked you, uh, where do you see currently the pain points or the gaps in our oral health system where innovation, entrepreneurship could make the largest impact um, what would be those top three things that come to mind for you? So, yeah, thank you so much, Maria, for the question. And again, the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, I think it is an exciting time in oral health research. And as you know, the topic of this webinar today on integration of oral health and systemic health, and how can we kind of crack through those many barriers that have existed between medicine and dentistry. You know, it, it stems from a, a long history of our medical and dental schools being separated. And many people who are seeking out oral health care feel that they have to navigate a very separate system from the medical system and, and gaining access to the care that they need. And so this whole access issue has become a challenge especially for many of those underserved populations where there are limitations in uh, the payer systems that are available for these individuals. So we look at the reach and the, you know, the bolus of practitioners in metropolitan areas, but we see so many different oral health disparities that exist uh, across the country. And that has led to many different challenges in the clinical care models. So uh, one of the things that, you know, at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, we have this integration with our School of Medicine, uh, where we have sought for uh, many decades to work to provide this integration. And so uh, many know that uh, within dentistry, there tends to be more of a surgical model of clinical care. So many people go to the dentist to get restorative reconstructive care, they may be in pain, and so they seek out that care for those urgent needs. Oftentimes, they may be reconstructive, or there, there may be a problem where a tooth needs to be removed, a uh, root canal therapy needs to be performed, a filling needs to be done. Whereas on the medical model of care, uh, there hasn't been as much of an emphasis. I think those of us in dental education recognize that but trying to create more of this emphasis on prevention and access to those, those populations in terms of education and public health. And uh, so much got exposed during the pandemic in terms of inequities uh, across the country. And oftentimes, you know, even the World Health Organization said it's not critical to see your dentist at this time. Let's focus on those most medically necessary procedures. Well, there is now such a backlog and that, that uh, you know, that, that difficulty ends up there. And then, uh, you're, you know, if, as you're mentioning the three different points and how that relates to entrepreneurs and those involved in innovation, 
I think that there are great opportunities in terms of innovation on both the reconstructive side, and we can talk more about that later, but also on the preventive side. And I know the second part of this uh, webinar, you're going to hear about an oral cancer diagnostic and how can dentistry better engage diagnostics using digital technologies uh, to better diagnose and prognosticate disease through personalized precision medicine types mm -hmm. of opportunities. Yes, that's, um, that's such an important point to highlight the, the need um, for uh, preventative care interventions rather than restorative care. Um, the, the, this notion that unless something is, hurt, is, hurt, is hurting or painful, you don't really go to the dentist. And that, uh, that ultimately adds up to something much more uh, serious down the road. Um, I, I want to make sure that you address some of the questions around, you teed up some of the issues around access and equity. Um, and many of us think about access and equity when it comes to you know, ethnicity. Um, and it is true that black adults are over 60% more likely to have an unmet dental need. And Latinos are more likely to report having difficulty doing their job due to poor oral health up to 50% higher. However, that discrepancy between access of care also holds true when it comes to uh, social economic status. And we know that people living in poverty are over 100% more likely to have difficulty doing their job because of oral health conditions. And so I do want to offer that to, to our listeners today to think about equitable access to care that spans beyond ethnicity, but looks at zip code and other barriers to access um, beyond the, what I would call the top of mind obvious ones. Right, yeah, I, I think Maria, you're hitting on a, a critically important issue, you know, mentioning zip code or looking at our black and brown communities where they don't have the same type of access as many other individuals. One of the things as an oral health educator that we've worked to engage on is to uh, diversify the workforce as well, uh, because uh, the number of Black Latinx dentists that we have across the country does not represent our population. And so this is something that within dental medicine, looking at uh, bringing on board healthcare providers and dentistry, dental hygiene, thinking of creative models. I know uh, it's a politically charged topic with mid-level providers or advanced dental hygienists, mm -hmm. but to create different workforce models to engage the various communities that are in greatest need. Uh, just last Friday, there was a, an editorial in JAMA Network by uh, the office of the director of the NIDCR on transforming clinical research to meet healthcare challenges. And the number one uh, leading topic on that editorial, Larry Tabak, who's a, a dentist and the deputy director of the NIH, uh, they had leading as centering opportunities around people and equity. That was a number one. That was on Friday that came out. And so it's not only looking at the healthcare providers, uh, for these patient populations for research, mm -hmm. uh, but also looking at creating clinical trial networks and patient populations that reflect differences in ethnicity, gender, sex, others. And uh, we, we saw that during the pandemic. Those individuals that in, in the black and brown communities, they had a much worse uh, morbidity in response to uh, COVID infection, for example. And it was based on a variety of factors, uh, some genetic, some might have been due to the locations. Yeah. And so I think that this ends up becoming very critical as we look at our workforce models. That's right. It's um, equity does not only pertain to access, but also has impact on clinical outcomes because we see they vary. Uh, based on different uh, ethnicities and zip codes and lifestyle situations, and so um, we we can't we can't under um, we, we can't put enough emphasis on that emphasis on that point. Um, is there um, you mentioned a couple of time and you times and you and I uh, those those of us who have talked to uh, either of us uh, on the on the webinar today know that we often talk about 
oral health as being part of overall health as an indicator of uh, poor oral health as an indicator of uh, poor health somewhere else in the body. And maybe it's it's worth a moment to unpack the ties between oral health and overall health. Um, you uh, are, when we talk about these types of connections, we're referring to a whole host of inflammatory diseases such as obesity, diabetes, pneumonia, even cognitive decline. Um, you're a periodontist. Uh, periodontal disease has recently been linked to uh, increased likelihood of developing um, dementia or Al Alzheimer's disease. Um, could you perhaps step us through some of those most important connections between oral health and overall health and focus on the ones that are most quote unquote actionable, right? Things that we could absolutely do something today as patients, as parts of the care team, dentists, hygienists, primary care physicians, and nurses. What are those clinical connections that are most actionable in your mind? Yeah, so uh, the, these are some excellent points, Maria. I do think that if we take, you know, so from my own bias as a periodontist, looking at those opportunities, you gave the example of diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, a variety of diseases that are associated with systemic inflammation. So we can work with uh, other uh, healthcare specialists, uh, generalists, primary care physicians, on bringing together, studying, and treating our patient populations in this reciprocal manner. If we consider diabetes and many of the different outcomes related to systemic inflammation, we know that those patients who receive periodontal treatment, this is a microbial infection that occurs, it starts on microbial biofilms on the tooth root surface that then work their way down the tooth and then can lead to local and then associated with systemic inflammation. And so when you have healthcare providers, diabetologists, or other uh, specialists within medicine that are focused on diabetic health, cardi cardiologists as well, we have had uh, workshops and symposia with our cardiologists as friends as well, where you do look at when a patient gets a workup to examine their dental health. And so I think the payer systems that provide the care, they can recognize that you can reduce HbA1c levels and some of the other uh, comorbidities associated with diabetes. Um, there has been a lot of new information on the whole microbiome. We're, we're looking at the microbiome within the oral cavity, but also in the gut microbiome. And it's not only a transiting of those pathogens that are swallowed by the patient when they're being produced within the oral cavity, but also they're eliciting local and distant immunological reactions that affect the gut microbiome. And so we've seen those patients with uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's and others that are associated with this whole connection between the oral gut microbiome. And uh, you know, one other uh, group of uh, specialists that we have worked on our own research collaborating with are bone health specialists. As you, as you look at uh, postmenopausal women at risk for osteoporosis, uh, at increased risk for tooth loss, earlier tooth loss, and collaborating with bone health specialists on systemic therapies that may help with either tooth preservation or in those patients who are at risk for uh, having that decreased bone mass and receiving uh, tooth replacement dental implants mm -hmm. and how we can really work together. And so there needs to be, you know, this, uh, I, I think a stronger uh, integration from that standpoint. But with, you know, the group here, you know, in terms of entrepreneurs, uh, certainly these diagnostics offer an entryway uh, for the specialists, both in medicine and in dentistry, to link together, because the, you know those communication pathways are not as strong as they should be. 
Yes, and it's sometimes all it comes down to is communication and care coordination. And Cummings, having spent decades in healthcare before I joined the oral health movement and being in oral health, I, I know firsthand how much effort and uh, resources is spent on case management and care coordination on the medical side. I don't think we're seeing as much effort on that medical dental coordination. I personally think that that's a ripe opportunity for innovation, not in the sense of shiny new toys or AI blockchain. We just need somebody to connect the dots for patients, dentists, medical teams to be able to action some of those insights. I do, um, I'll just give a very quick example. There was a study in Jada published where they looked at cost of care, total cost of care for diabetic patients from 2017 to 2018. And what they studied was for those patients who got their diabetic patients who got their periodontal disease treated. So diabetic patients who don't have their periodi uh, uh, periodontal disease treated versus those who did, that's what they compared. And treating periodontal disease purely in this case meant encourage your patient to max out use up all their benefits in their current dental plan. Did not include uh, cover more procedures or do anything different. Purely make sure that you are going to the dentist and if it's applicable, take advantage of those periodontal trick of um, cleanings and anything else that's covered by your plan. And what that study found out is that for commercial insured, insured patients, the cost of treating diabetic patients dropped down by 12%. And for Medicaid patients, the cost for treating those patients dropped down by 14%. So we're seeing that in a very, in, in, a, uh, in, in the claims data, I encourage again, those entrepreneurs and innovators to help us care coordinate. And in this case, all we wanted to do was make sure that the patients actually take advantage of the benefits that already exist. That alone would make a big difference in cost of care, care for um, diabetes. Yes, I mean, I think that's an excellent example, Maria, in terms of looking at something as, as simple, but a large healthcare burden of diabetes. And if we can get this bringing together of medical insurance and dental insurance to demonstrate that, that reciprocal interaction where there can be a true benefit from both sides and for patients minimally to take advantage of those healthcare benefits, but also to look at some creative strategies for the medical insurance networks to recognize that their patients will be much better served over the long term as it relates to a variety of different healthcare outcomes, including cardiovascular disease. Again, these are diseases that are chronic in nature that often take years and decades to develop. So those, those organizations that have the long view will, will be at, a, at an advantage. So, you know, an example that I will give you that we're starting to see in healthcare. So uh, in medicine and in uh, cancer, treatment, there is a staging and grading of disease. So disease severity, and then the grading factors of those cofactors that can affect the disease outcomes. So we'll hear a little bit later about oral cancer diagnostics. We do know that systemic inflammation may be a cofactor, or we may know with arthritic diseases, uh, with inflammatory bowel, others, they may be modulated. And in the grading of diseases, periodontal disease is one where smoking and diabetes, two environmental factors, can change healthcare outcomes. And we've also seen genetics. And so one study we did about a decade ago on patient stratification looked at patients who saw a dentist regularly, either once or twice a year, and then looked at smoking diabetes in the presence of a genetic factor and we found those individuals that had increasing risk factors, lost more teeth and had more expensive outcomes and uh, in terms of needing to see the dentist. So I think the insurance industry and having these big databases are so valuable for us as researchers in the area, but health policy uh, individuals who can really bring this forward to, to make these policy changes. 
That's that's so insightful and and really um, what it comes down to the biggest breakthroughs and the impact might not necessarily come in from the most complicated technology or most complicated solution. Um, hopefully that message is resonating and coming across clear from both of us today on the call. Um, I, I want to acknowledge a couple of questions that are coming in and requests. Um, please know that all the studies that we are uh, quoting and mentioning, we will provide links for them um, uh, as a reference in the uh, replay option. Um, I see a lot of folks commenting on um, the systemic health connections. Uh, yes, during COVID, uh, there was a severe exacerbation of the need for um, oral health, um, frankly, catching up to uh, bring back our oral health to uh, baseline, if you will. And we do know there are studies uh, to some uh, one of our uh, comments on the in the chat. There are studies that uh, patients who have untreated periodontal disease or um, cavities are more likely to end up on the ventilator, and more likely to have an adverse COVID outcome. Um, and so we have seen that connection as well. Um, I'd love to um, kind of continue the talk around the conversation around uh, the dental team being integral part of the overall health team. We need to have a much more expanded view of what a health team looks like to take care of the whole patient. And that health team would include the medical team with dent with nurses and, and uh, primary care special uh, primary care doctors and specialists, but it would also include the hygienist and the dentist and the nurse practitioner and the, maybe the school and the community. And so in that context, um, uh, Dr. Ginobili, we have, Harvard is, is in fact the only school in the country um, that I'm aware of that currently offers an integrated program uh, that looks both at dental medicine and, and general medicine. And there's numerous initiatives underway really focusing on integrating oral health and medicine from uh, the from by from you know the very beginning when we educate the future leaders of those industries. So tell us more, a little bit more about um, why is this a focus for your school and the curriculum that you put in front of um, the future dentists? Yeah, so you know the the Harvard School of Dental Medicine's had a long history of integrating medicine and dentistry. So the school started in 1867, but in 1899, we became a part of the faculty of medicine. And so that has continued to this day. So our dental students uh, train alongside our, our medical students for the first 14 to 16 months. And so they really get this strong uh, basis of their training within medicine anchored. And so there's always been this strong ethos within Harvard that there's the importance of the integration. And I think as we look to the future of dentistry, it's only going to become more important uh, as, as dentistry maintains its status as a healthcare profession. I think this is important because we do see that there are obviously the aesthetic, cosmetic, functional concerns of you know, oral health, dental medicine, but you know, having that linkage, I think, has been important for our students as they go on to become leaders in uh, either oral health research, education, and in planning of you know other dental schools. We've we've seen that there's been a proliferation of new dental schools across the country. Some of them proprietary, mm -hmm. uh, some of them you know not for profit like our school. And I think it's going to be important for the future of the healthcare profession that we're training individuals who understand this integration and hopefully we can break through to, to have some advances in clinical care where there is more of an integration. So uh, we have felt it's important. And I'm, when you see today, many of the other dental schools don't have necessarily the access to a strong uh, hospital network or other medical colleagues for the collaboration. The dental programs themselves are very solid, but you know having that opportunity. And so that's that's been one of our niches that we've worked to develop over the years. How do you see that connection in um, having that integrated curriculum play out in um, the practice of dentistry? Um, in in and I, I have to remind those, those of, uh, of our listeners on the phone that 
Um, about 140 million Americans visit a single healthcare provider, medical or dental, every year, but not both. And so if we think that uh, over a third of Americans only see, see either their dentist or their PCP, we truly have only one chance to engage that patient in their overall health. And so to me, that's why this uh, question around integrated care is so important. Um, so tell us a little bit about, uh, Dean Ginobili, about how you know, that integrated curriculum sets the stage for integrated practice of care down the road. And what are perhaps, as a secondary point, what are the perhaps the um, things that a dentist, a graduate from uh, your program could do within their scope of decisions versus things that are outside of their of their realm of influence, things around billing and reimbursement and scope of practice. What's in their in their uh, sphere of influence and changing, and what's out of their hand, their hands, if you will? Yes, uh, you know, in terms of these questions, you know, looking at these opportunities for interprofessional education, I think is what you're getting at, right. and we see many dental schools are working to create these, these opportunities for students to work together with nurse practitioners, dental hygienists, social workers, other healthcare providers to work as a team. And uh, so that's something that we've worked to create an affiliation we have with the Massachusetts College of uh, Pharmacy and Health Sciences. They have a dental hygiene program looking to bring in other healthcare providers uh, you're aware of with uh, a collaboration with the with CareQuest Institute for Oral Health on looking at the medical billing component, right? Again, we can't ask our healthcare providers to give these procedures, you know, gratis, but to create an opportunity. Uh, I, I had seen some of the latest numbers were approaching 30 million Americans see their dentist or dental hygienist regularly, but do not see their physician. So this demonstration project that we have in collaboration with uh, CareQuest is looking at trying to develop a, a billing model for wellness visits within the dental practice and creating a lower stakes environment for many of the patients who have uh, their own uh, anxieties about going in and making that appointment if they don't have an emergency, uh, but they can go see a nurse practitioner within the dental office. It's the, it's the flip side when we see uh, dental patients going to the emergency room right. for an emergency extraction or a pulpitis, a problem with their tooth. We want to mitigate those types of, of situations. And so, you know, the, the second half of your question, you know, what can we do as entrepreneurs and other healthcare innovators is, you know, are we able to develop models that truly are the win-win where we can integrate within dental offices. And you've seen with oral maxillofacial surgeons bring on board uh, anesthetists and nurses and other healthcare providers or hospital-based dentistry. So they're a part of the hospital system. And there are groups of healthcare providers that work in that arena, but within the traditional dental office, it hasn't been set up that way. And I think as we look at the future of dental clinical care delivery, multidisciplinary group practices are becoming much more common. And so within that multi-group uh, practice setting, there could be really nice opportunities to uh, bring on board you know, other healthcare providers uh, that are co-located in the same uh, That's right. organizational and we're seeing structure. Some of those models come to, to life some of the largest DSOs are going right. as far as integrating uh, Epic as a as a, a dental record, EHR in the dental clinics. And specifically, we know Pacific Dental, for example, is running medical clinics in some of the cases next to dental clinics to be able to better take care of some of those chronic conditions. Um, I don't want to lose the point that you made about emergency room visits over half a billion dollar is spent on oral health related ED visits in Medicare alone. These are preventable visits likely because unfortunately um, our EDs are not always well equipped to take care 
of a dental issue. And most likely the patient will be discharged with some sort of a pain management um, a tool or antibiotics and will be asked to go visit and schedule a, a dentist appointment. And so if we're able to even focus on triaging and redirecting and helping those patients alone, uh, the savings in the system will be really meaningful. Yes, yes, no, absolutely. And I think that, you know, this, this, this training aspect, it's not only on the, the oral healthcare provider side, but to help educate our physician colleagues. Many of them, they will only have one day devoted to oral health in their entire four years of medical school. Uh, but many of them are leading ER departments across the country in hospitals. And so there may or may not be dentists attending dentists in those specific hospitals. So what can we do to better train our, our healthcare providers in those settings? That's right. Training is one of them. I've, um, I've also noticed that um, in, in my work specifically, we're looking to also remove barriers, um, administrative barriers, such as be having the right CPT code. So a primary care doctor or pediatric um, uh, specialist could apply silver diamond fluoride to arrest cavities in, in young patients. Um, and being able for a, for a primary care physician to apply uh, what is a, effectively a rinse or a paste on the tooth uh, and then be able to bill for it is really important step in encouraging some of those behaviors uh, on the medical side that would serve as preventative me measures on the dental side. And, and similarly, mm -hmm. in, um, Dean Ginobili, you actually touched on the, the disconnect between preventative care versus much more um, invasive and interventional care on the uh, oral health side. Um, we are seeing many solutions now that are coming up in the market that allow us to uh, identify oral health issues early, like diagnosing um, uh, caries lesions. Uh, currently, the standard practice of, of care is to see the lesion and perhaps when it's big enough to put in a filling. We know there are different solutions on the market like a peptide P114, also known as Curidon, that could talk about regenerative uh, medicine, regenerate, guided regeneration of enamel, so that early lesion gets um, rebuilt, the enamel rebuilds itself in, a, in layman's terms, if you will. And so being able to have a code that allows dentists to bill for that solution didn't exist before. So I'm very proud of the work that we've been able to do in that space where it not only are we able to identify and validate those preventative innovative solutions, but then also allow the, the system that wasn't designed to accommodate for some of those innovative solutions to catch up and have the billable codes to, to make sure that uh, those behaviors we wanna drive are there. Yeah, absolutely. And we're seeing that you know within the Medicare space, there's there's been many different efforts uh, you know, advancing from the Affordable Care Act with our seniors uh, on, you know, the provision of care. You're using the example of silver diamine fluoride with our pediatric patients and how can pediatricians, pediatric dentists work together uh, from an educational standpoint and other outreach areas. And as you just gave the example with the Curidon technology, some of these early stage therapeutics that can be delivered uh, very close to this juncture point of, you know, finding at-risk patients because we can identify what many of those risk factors are with our young patients uh, and different patient populations to have a more engage, a better engagement on their preventive recalls and assessments, then you can intervene at an earlier stage where you're not talking about endodontic therapy, yes. crown and bridge type of work, or even to the end of tooth extraction. That's right. I, um, I'm, I'm very excited about the examples you, you mentioned. I also um, appreciate that we've called out a couple of opportunities for innovators, bold uh, entrepreneurs to take on some of those challenges and gaps in care that we're seeing in oral health. Um, and in your um, astute career, you've actually also served on not only as a researcher and innovator, but you've also served as an advisor for the FDA on dental devices. And so um, if I could 
ask you to think through all the different roles of, in your career. Um, could you give us some examples of uh, solutions that you see very promising or, or technologies that you see very promising, both on the dental side, but even more so on the medical side? Last year, we had over 20% of our Smile Health uh, cohort of medical companies and solutions that we were testing to see if there were use cases on the oral health side. I'm a firm believer of innovation across silos and disciplines. So what examples of promising technologies come to mind for you that are on the medical side that could be used on the dental? Right. So, you know, this becomes an, an interesting point because for myself, being a member of the FDA pan advisory panel, there are not a large number of dental technologies that come through through a PMA or a new drug or new device uh, exemption. And so how do we get more dental technologies through the pipeline? And oftentimes this occurs when a medical device or a new drug is used for other applications in medicine. So uh, great examples I can use are these regenerative factors like the bone morphogenetic proteins, platelet derived growth factor. These are both growth factors that were used in medicine, uh, BMPs for spinal fusion to treat uh, fractures and parts of the skeleton, and then eventually uh, an application put forth for extraction socket healing, sinus floor augmentation, platelet-derived growth factor being approved for neuropathic diabetic ulcers, also in orthopedics, and then in dental for periodontal regeneration. Those are some examples. And as we look at some of our collaborations with uh, companies, they see that path is one that is, is a little bit lower stakes where they find that, again, this relates to the medical dental integration where there's this opportunity. And so personally, over the past uh, couple of years, we've been collaborating with those bone health specialist companies that are looking at bone anabolic agents that it can increase bone mass that not only help patients prevent vertebral fractures and uh, radius ulnar fractures, yeah. but they also increase bone mass to allow dental implant placement and have these, these other downstream effects of increasing bone mass in the jaws, maybe tooth retention. It hasn't been shown, but could be impacted as well. So those are some examples from, from that standpoint. And for um, those of us, uh, those of the entrepreneurs out there listening, these are great examples that, um, again, with leaders like uh, Dean Ginobili on the engaged uh, in the FDA review and the advisory board, there is a path to raising awareness about the opportunities in oral health. Um, I, I I know that the FDA has been, we always like to kind of use the FDA as the, the, the big shadow of uh, a delay. And if you need an FDA clearance, this is, a, this is going to be a showstopper. But in many ways, we've seen the FDA being uh, progressive, especially when it comes to approving some of the software as a medical device, um, the solutions, and especially when there's a, there's a predicate and there's an established need. Right. So I would encourage folks not to be discouraged by uh, right. the need to, to have a FDA pathway through your innovation. Um, in the course of the Smile Health program, it's only 15 weeks. We don't think we could actually take that challenge on as part of, of Smile. But if you need FDA clearance, that shouldn't deter you from applying and taking on that um, innovation opportunity. Yes, and I think, Maria, as you bring up this point, I think that there are many organizations that collaborate with dentistry in terms of providing some of this guidance. So we do work with uh, regulatory experts, but those also involved in clinical adoption. As you know, it's, there's the clinical need, and then there's the need from the, the scientific standpoint of the new technology and how can this work together. So we bring together engineers and scientists with clinicians to come up with that clinical need that can impact practice. And so when you look at the end in mind, how would this technology get into the clinic and how would it be adopted? Uh, because that's, that's the highest hurdle. And so as a part of our Regenerative Medicine Resource Center, it's a collaboration with uh, the Wyss Institute at Harvard, University of Michigan and University of Pittsburgh. And we collaborate with a, a 
many individuals in the industry to help de-risk technologies. And some of them, they're a great idea, but the regulatory pathway may discourage others. And then you want to look at that bar to uh, be able to meet that, uh, reduce that hurdle to get into the, the proof of concept that eventually you would hopefully be a game changer in the field. That's 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 spot on. Um, and I'm glad we were able to touch on this. So uh, perhaps in the interest of time, I've been following the chat. Um, what a great, rich list of questions and insights in the chat. So thank you, everyone who's been um, active and engaged in the discussion. I will um, I will try to cover a couple of the questions as we uh, go through that are clustered around similar themes. Um, Dean Ginobili, I see um, some a handful of questions around uh, financial incentives um, and uh, incentives for both uh, dental practices, large DSOs, uh, you know, uh, dentists to move from that fee for service transaction based model to more restorative or uh, value of restorative to a preventative model. Currently, the system is designed to encourage those restorative procedures. Um, and so it will require uh, system change in many ways, uh, workflow changes and, and financial incentives. So what are your thoughts on um, uh, what are the key pieces that we need to move towards that end state that you and I describe more preventative, right. more proactive? Right. I, I think as you bring up the point, I, you know, the existing dental reimbursement model is really insufficient to address all of these various need, needs. And so I think that, you know, the obvious, obviously the healthcare integration, if we can have the opportunities for interprofessional clinical care delivery, that it, that is one of the obvious ones. And you gave the example, Pacific Dental Services and other large uh, DSOs that are looking at medical dental integration models for the billing piece. Once one gets through that uh, aspect, that will be a game changer. Uh, in the delivery of care. And then I think uh, looking at a couple of these questions here, individuals asking about that, we can use a couple of examples in dentistry. If you take the use of dental implants, which we recognize that it's an expensive therapy, but it, it was eventually driven by a high demand from patients when dental implants were found to be uh, predictable, right? So once they became predictable and training programs expanded for dental implant reconstruction, patients were willing to pay for that technology. And uh, we acknowledge that very few dental insurances pay for it, but there's a, there's a high utilization of dental implants uh, in the US and globally. Uh, but as we look at the more preventive services, I do think as we can collaborate more with medicine, use the SDF example, mm -hmm. uh, oral cancer screenings and others that, you know, as these diagnostics can be demonstrated to be cost effective, uh, you know, that's where dentists are not so familiar with, you know, implementing diagnostics and seeing questions here, yes. periodontal disease, dental caries, two very common ones, if you can break through on those more rapid uh, diagnostics, but it's going to take some innovative policymakers uh, to to break through in that dimension. Um, and I also would like to uh, clarify a common misconception we, when we talk about, and I've seen this both in my time on the medical side and now on the dental side. When we talk about payers in uh, a homo homogenous way, we need to understand the different nuances of the ultimate payer. We have government programs like Medicare, Medicaid that have different follow different standards and policies when it comes to reimbursement. And we have commercial payers. And what we fail to sometimes appreciate on the commercial insurance side is that um, in many ways, the commercial benefit provider is not ultimately the one who defines what benefits an employee would have. It comes down to the self-insured employers. And I believe that's it. My, my view is that we have uh, an underappreciated stakeholder at the table, which are the large employers, especially when it comes to oral health, that could drive decisions and make meaningful changes in the way we reimburse and what we benefit when it comes to preventative care. 
I'll give you exam another example, and we'll quote that study in um, Guardian uh, run a study between 2011 and 2017, where they looked at self-insured employers and their uh, dental claims. And they categorized insurance um, employers based on uh, preventative uh, models of employers who were reimbursing different number of cleanings instead of two, four number of not four cleanings a year, and um, and non-preventative care model insurance uh, uh, employers. And so the employers who were categorized as preventative employers or models of care, they were spending on average about 36% higher cost on preventative services. Those same employers, however, were spending on average over 80% less on inter in interventions that were the interventions that were more expensive and, and, and more surgical in nature. And so when we think about the case study for preventative care over um, more invasive care, this is a very, uh, it's a prime example. Now, the caveat is it took five years of data, 20, six years of data, 2011 to 2017 to be able to see the trend. Um, and so that's where we as business leaders and executives and thought leaders and researchers and innovators have a role to play to be able to come up with those solutions and have a little bit more of a longer term view because the math clears, the business case is there. Absolutely. Right. I mean, the what you've just given an example of is that the un, I would just underline the point, the long view versus the short view. That's right. And that's where we're seeing uh, these impacts within all systemic diseases. They again, they don't happen overnight. And if the the various types of third party payers, governmental uh, insurance groups recognize that, again, we have these innovative policymakers who can bring them together. That's and yeah. and um, and thank you for the questions along that line. Uh, I can again, it goes back. We're almost full circle. We look for innovations and solutions that allow us to connect the dots between dental interventions or interventions on the oral health side that in, impact overall clinical outcomes, overall health outcomes, even if they're on the medical side. Um, I believe we have a um, time for one or two more questions. Um, so uh, perhaps we. Um, we we do we we take that as a um, I'll I'll there are two things that I would like to probably touch on, um, uh, Dr. Jean Albi, could we maybe talk a little bit about the role of data interoperability in um, in in as a, a tailwind, if you will, to help um, drive some of those connections between medical and dental care, and even advance some of those preventative. Uh, payment models. Um, what do you see the opportunities and the gaps and what are the things that you are encouraged by today? Right. So what we see is that most of the clinical, the large clinical studies done in dentistry, uh, some of them are multi-center uh, investigator initiated uh, clinical trials, and they're on the order of dozens to hundreds of patients. And they're really insufficient for us to be able to make uh, significant claims on. And uh, so I think it's going to be important to take advantage of big data. And we're seeing this with uh, large DSOs. We're seeing it with uh, insurance companies that have access to data. And then the next stage is to have quality data, to, to go through those data to make sure that they are of the quality that then one can look to integrate the, the dental information there. And so we've seen AI machine learning uh, technologies being able to cluster together and using data science to, ident you know, to identify trends and associations that, I mean, obviously you need prospective studies to de you know, mm -hmm. determine if there's causality, but I think data science will open up a lot of these areas that uh, I think that the third party payer environment will will take note of and listen to this um, in the provision of care. I think that will speak for itself. Um, I, I did see there was a question here on medical dental integration training and how really it has not been successful. I would I would agree with this point and that you know from a public health standpoint and several people brought up the cost component yeah. on where that is. Uh, Certainly from a public health standpoint in mobile dental care, 
or going out into communities, more rapid screening programs for diseases uh, could be beneficial to then bring those patients in and using other types of models of clinical care delivery. I think it's a good point. It's it's a it's a critical point to think about um, education as an opportunity and and frankly meeting patients where they are it goes back to our original point of care does not have to happen only in the dental chair in the dental office uh, yes. it happens in the community in the church in the school and we're seeing multiple successful models um, that are what I would consider prime to be scaled right and what and and we we have to remember that a model that works in a single county in a single state may need to be adapted to work nationwide. However, there are enough examples of successful models um, in uh, mobile care delivery. And uh, Dean Ginobili, you mentioned AI as a decision support tool, as a visualization tool, as an insights generating tool, maybe even diagnostic tool as a screener. Um, and I, I would love to also highlight uh, technologies like uh, uh, teledentistry and ability to see patients uh, virtually. Um, that, if anything, COVID did uh, show us that this is feasible, definitely on the medical side, and we have some work to do to expand that uh, on the dental side. But when I think about some of the questions we started with, how do we triage patients away from ED, uh, high cost, low efficacy interventions like visit to the ED for oral pain. Um, I think virtual care uh, network could, uh, could could be a very good solution in, in that specific example. Great. Yes, yeah, I was, uh, and I'll provide this link. I was just looking to pull this up for you um, in terms of, you know, AI. I mean, we, we're, we're very much trying to figure out all of the opportunities with AI. We will have a global symposium Yes. Uh, here at Harvard in the fall on that and really bring it together. You give the great examples of using telehealth, uh, looking at AI with large databases. And then we have all the impl implications as it relates to uh, you know how the FDA is going to assess these technologies. Dentistry has been leading uh, as, it, as it relates to diagnostic imaging and then as we look at pathology and then eventually in patient stratification, looking at risk. And so, um, you know, this is where a lot of our younger colleagues are, who are getting involved. We have our Kempner Institute at Harvard that, you know, launched by the Zuckerberg Chan Foundation to really promote uh, AI. And the major focus is on training the next generation as we as we recognize with our, our young people, their ability to take in and adapt using AI machine learning technologies. And I think with the big data, that will eventually uh, become very important. That's ex extremely important. Thank you for uh, flagging. Uh, what a great opportunity to get deeper uh, into the um, uh, potential, untapped potential of AI into, in dentistry. Uh, again, for those of you who um, are looking to get exposed into that topic, um, the, the symposium at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine is a great way to do it. It's November, early November, November 3rd and 4th um, here in Boston. Um, I, I can't thank you enough, Dean Ginobili, for being with us today. Uh, what a great um, start of, of our Monday of the week here. Um, I'm very excited also and grateful for the uh, highly engaging conversation. And so for those of you who want to stay engaged, um, please uh, look for the replay and the notes uh, of the replay link. This is where we would tag all the studies that we mentioned today, as well as some additional resources that you might want to consider um, and the initiative that, that, that Dean Ginobili and his team are leading across medical dental integration and entrepreneurship. So thank you again for joining us uh, today, Dean Ginobili. Um, and with that, I would... Um, now hand it back to uh, Gina, who is uh, uh, our partner in crime and um, a leader at Matter Health, who's been helping us lead the effort on multiple fronts when it comes to smile health. Um, thank you, Gina, I'm handing it over to you. 
Amazing. Well, thanks, Maria. And thank you, Dr. Ginobili, for a fascinating uh, discussion. This is all fertile um, groundwork for what we are about to discuss right now, which is the 2023 edition of Smile Health. Um, before we go much further, though, Maria, I might ask you to just talk a little bit about CareQuest Institute of Oral Health and CareQuest Innovation Partners, who are really at the helm of this uh, initiative. Great, thank you. Um, and um, as some of you heard, uh, the references to our parent company, CareQuest Institute for Oral Health, this is the largest nonprofit that is tasked with improving oral health for all. Um, the um, nonprofit is um, focused on uh, cutting edge research, advocacy, and grant making. Um, we are committed to uh, encouraging and promoting um, capacity building in uh, low income, hard to reach areas that are uh, hardest hit when it comes to unmet oral needs. And so the CareQuest Institute for Oral Health exists to further its mission, um, improving oral health for all. That same mission is what connects uh, our company, CareQuest Innovation Partners, which is a for-profit um, entity fully owned by the Institute. And the reason that's important is because the two organizations are share are bonded by the shared mission of improving oral health for all. The Institute does it through nonprofit tools like grant making and research and advocacy. And the for-profit organization, CareQuest Innovation Partners, does it through for-profit tools like impact investing, um, partnering with organizations uh, to bring uh, products to market, um, advisory services. We exist to validate and scale transformative solutions that improve oral, overall health through oral health. So those transformative solutions that we talked about that make um, our healthcare system more equitable, accessible, and integrated. And if you do one more click, Gina, you will see the mission statement that connects all, uh, all of us together. Um, maybe as a double click on CareQuest Innovation Partners, um, we have multiple capabilities and that's, uh, and over the course of the, of the program, you will get exposed to multitudes of ways in which we create what I call proof points on the clinical and business side to de-risk and validate some of those, those transformative solutions we talked about. Amazing. And I think we'll talk about that certainly as we right. step into the program. It's, it's really the DNA of the program itself. Um, well, with that, guys, let's talk a little bit about this. You heard at the upfront and throughout, you know, what is, what is our 2023 Smile Health looking for? And really, we are looking for solutions that provide ac accessible, equitable, and integrated oral health care. Um, but if you're sitting in the audience and you are not a traditional um, oral health innovator, you're working in maybe a parallel disease state or other um, area, uh, please, you know, think about how your solution might fit into this. Um, you know, beyond that, we're, we're really um, collaborating to see how we can uh, connect these these uh, startups and innovators to really industry leading organizations to really advance what this can look like. And it's through the program itself. So let's look a, a little bit at the timeline that we have. Um, we opened applications for this year's program in early March, and I'm uh, happy to share that we'll be closing this upcoming Friday. So if you are uh, an innovator that is interested in uh, participating in the program, you still have time. Uh, we will drop the link to uh, our current landing page where you can access the application. Um, certainly let us know if you have questions along this way. Uh, for the next month or so, we will be uh, looking at the solutions that have come through the pipeline, really trying to make best matches um, and we'll talk a little bit about the validation study in a moment here, but really making um, meaningful connections to partners who have uh, determined that they will participate in the program. And then June 5th, we'll be making that announcement. The Smile Health program is a 12-week footprint. It will run from June 12th through September 1st. Um, and during those 12 weeks, we provide a uh, really uh, best in class curriculum suited and tailored to the folks that are participating, mentorship, and then most critically, as has been mentioned many times, those validation studies. So that is 
a bespoke matching between a startup and an industry partner, what we like to call a scale partner, to really answer a key question around um, part of a solution so that there's a proof point. At the end of this program, it's not just that you're doing a presentation, it's that you legitimately have something that you can say, I validated, I've moved this forward, and my solution is now more marketplace ready. Um, at the tail end of our program, we have two separate ways that our uh, innovators are able to kind of share their learnings and successes. One is a private invite only stakeholder day in Chicago. This is really intended for the scale partners that have participated in these validation studies, as well as our uh, venture friends to participate and learn more around um, the companies. Uh, and then Demo Day, and we're really, really excited to share that we will be at Health or HLTH conference that will take place in Las Vegas this October. We are looking at Sunday, October 8th as our Demo Day, um, and it's really um, exciting for us in part because we will be bringing this integrated uh, perspective for a meeting that has traditionally focused mainly on traditional medicine and healthcare to the oral health community and uh, bringing the two together in a really meaningful way. Um, before I move on, Maria, any call outs on the timeline? <clears throat> no. No, the, the time is now, guys. So for all of you who are on the verge of applying, now is the time to do it. And um, again, it's, a, it's an illustration to the point mm -hmm. that uh, Dean Ginobili and I were making that we are looking to bring the discussion about oral health into the health discourse. And that's one of the reasons why you're seeing us bringing the demo day uh, to the largest healthcare conference with over 12,000 attendees, um, HLTH. We are taking half a day of their agenda and we are turning this into a systemic health uh, component of the agenda, which is um, really uh, the first step of bringing that systemic overall health connection to oral health. Amazing. Um, we have just a few more notes for you all. And Maria, you talked a little bit about kind of the mission and this is a little bit about the validation and scaling uh, kind of uh, linkage that you have uh, at CareQuest Innovation Partners that really is folded into the, the DNA, as I said, of uh, the SMILE Health Program. Is there anything you would want to add here? The only uh, highlight is to just um, uh, remind folks that there is a vast resource of data capabilities um, and access to network of, of uh, customers, potential customers for those companies, potential investors for those companies uh, through the shared database uh, uh, that uh, CareQuest Institute has. We have the largest database of dental claims data um, in the US and that provides a very fruitful ground for validation studies to, to be run in uh, highlighting those business cases for your solution. We also have um, a handful of data partners who work with us. So if there's data that we don't have in-house, we have we uh, most likely know the people who have it to conduct meaningful validation studies. I think that's an important point, which is that this is not just about the solution. This is about the synthesis, right? This is around the aha. Um, and how we can take information and insights and make solutions stronger, better, more market ready. Um, so definitely a, a key component here. <clears throat> so one other thing we want to uh, share is, you know, please look at smilestartup.com. Uh, we'll drop it in the chat. Uh, but if you are a startup, please apply. If you are a partner, either a uh, a DSO, a payer, a uh, university or an academic institute, and you're interested in getting involved in the program, there's room. If you're an investor looking to broaden your uh, solution set in your portfolio to include oral health or novel uh, solutions, let us know. We'd love to have you on board. Um, there's really a great opportunity here. Um, so we've gotten a few questions and I just wanna, you know, pulse into this. It's an early stage startups tied to the challenge statement. Again, you don't have to have worked in oral health. Um, you know, if you, we have a question here about what 
parts of the programs will be remote versus in person. The majority of the program is facilitated remotely. Just the um, in stakeholder and demo day will be in person. Um, you know, the program is very conscientious that we have innovators from around the world. And last year we had folks from uh, New Zealand. Uh, we had folks that were uh, out of uh, the EU. So there's absolutely flexibility around uh, where you can be located. Um, we're looking to really provide those solution sets. And then, uh, of course, <clears throat> Um, you know, it doesn't have to be oral health. If you can, if you are in a parallel field or another field and you can even think of a linkage, apply. You know, we're excited to see uh, the ideas that are out there. Um, here are a handful of the collaborators that we had in 2022 that partnered with the program. We are uh, in the process of getting our 2023 collaborators, both our scale and impact partners, uh, on board, and I am happy to report that many of them that you see here will be coming back and more. So please stay tuned. Um, those are some exciting announcements and certainly offer, to Maria's point, that really um, fertile um, matching and uh, networking opportunity. And, and Gina, perhaps I'll, I'll put in a, um, another uh, clarification. The, the program is designed to be extremely founder friendly. And we do not take equity in the startups who get admitted to the program. In fact, every startup is receiving $10,000 stipend to be able to really dedicate the time to this program. The, the program is extremely impact focused in the sense that at the end of the 15 weeks of the validation study, we really want the company to have much stronger and clearer answer on how would this solution uh, drive impact at scale? And so uh, b b as we evaluate companies that might be a good fit for the 2023 cohort, we ask ourselves, what would need to be true for that solution to reach its intended impact at scale? Do they need a customer? Do they need a health plan and a dental plan reimbursement answer? Do they need a business case and a value prop for a DSO. Based on the answer to that question, we then tap our network for who the optimal impact partner might be for that organization. And so it very may well be the case that we end up with such a strong number of cohort participants that the optimal match is not already listed in our impact partners list. That doesn't mean that we couldn't pick up the phone and find that impact partner for them. In fact, that happened last year at least two times. So please um, use the impact partners list as a indicative and suggestive list. This is not by any stretch of the imagination exhaustive. Um, we are coming to this program um, with the intention to create a robust set of validated solutions that would then be um, scalable. Uh, in the marketplace. And a good outcome from the validation study is the impact partner to become a customer or to become a, a contracted partner uh, to the startup, in addition to obviously raising funding. So um, wanted to highlight the and kind of clarify the list of the impact partners here. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think that's a great point too, um, uh, that there are some ongoing relationships beyond that validation study that happened last year. And uh, you'll hear more about successes uh, in just a little bit in a little bit here as we talk to one of our program participants, but certainly that was um, the experience of a number of the uh, participants from last year. Um, I do want to um, answer one more question here uh, that I see coming in around where folks are located. There's some folks from Dubai and India. Uh, and again, it's a global solution. So if your solution is intended for a specific market that you're working in, um, welcome, you know, come aboard. Uh, we are looking for solutions uh, that are uh, demonstrating value and scalability, uh, regardless of where you're from. So please, you know, please step in and, and uh, certainly apply. <clears throat> With that said, um, to give you all a little bit more of a firsthand point of view on how this program has worked, I would like to invite to, um, to come on camera and come on screen, Dr. Rafat Hasina, who is from ORSDX, one of the 2022 cohort participants. Uh, Rafat? Hello, good morning. 
Hi, nice to see you. Um, so Rafat, you know, Oris DX, let's start with a, a description of just what you all do. So my name is Rafat Hasina, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Oris DX. And what Oris DX has developed is a, a salivary diagnostic aid to detect oral cancers by using oral rinses or saliva from uh, patients who have uh, an existing lesion or patients who are at high risk of developing cancer. Amazing. And, and Rafat, tell me, what made you all um, interested in applying to the 2022 program? So in 2022 is when um, OrisDX came into existence. So we are a spin out of, uh, out of the University of Chicago. We developed the science. We are scientists. We were a bunch of scientists who uh, developed this uh, assay in the laboratory. And we thought uh, that we wanted to um, bring this to market to our patients to uh, facilitate uh, the, you know, not only the U US population, but the global population where, you know, the incidence of oral cancer and uh, the diagnosis is, is very late. So um, what we did was we, we participated in some uh, incubators and accelerators at the University of Chicago, and we ended up uh, winning a huge challenge and getting funded uh, for close to a million dollars. But then uh, that was the NVC uh, challenge, I have to name it. Um, but then what happened was that, you know, we developed a business plan. We developed a, a, a way to see, you know, what this what this test can do, but we really didn't have a pathway developed yet to figure out what was our go-to-market strategy. You know, what was the what would what did the patients want? Where was where was all of this going? And right at that moment, you know, Smile Health Program uh, came to our uh, notice that there was this uh, program that that not only would allow us to validate or do some validation studies, validate some of our assumptions, but also partner with the exact, you know, stakeholders that we needed to partner with to figure out, you know, what was what was uh, our insurance model going to be? How are we going to get in reimbursed, right? So that's why we applied. We uh, we actually saw one of these webinars before we uh, we were looking at it, and you know, we 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 were sold. So we applied, and luckily for us, we we got selected. Amazing. Well, let's talk a little bit about the experience um, as a member of the cohort and going through the curriculum, uh, the mentorship, and then the validation study. What was it like? Um, you know, in one word, it was amazing. I mean, it was the most uh, fast paced 12 weeks uh, and, you know, uh, so productive 12 weeks of uh, RSDX at that time. So we uh, were fortunate enough to be partnered with not one, but three stakeholders. There were um, a lot of people who wanted to work with RSDX to you know, see if they could help develop this oral cancer diagnostic aid. And we partnered with Colgate um, and DentaQuest and Cigna. You know, Colgate is a consumer-based company that uh, helped us develop a study uh, uh, or a survey where we uh, were able to reach uh, 300 consumers. So we selected who we wanted to reach, what are the questions we wanted to ask to validate some of our assumptions that patients were actually interested in a non-invasive salivary diagnostic test or that patients were, you know, were they happy with the current situation? You know, what, what was their problem? What were they facing? Uh, so we found that, uh, dental uh, patients uh, really were excited about a non-invasive test that didn't let, you know, didn't uh, include uh, cutting out a piece of their tissue to find out if that lesion was cancer or not. Because many times what happens is that there are people who are walking around with lesions uh, and they go to a dentist and it's, it's not sure what it is. And so the dentist has to actually do a biopsy. But once you do a biopsy, the biopsy can come back negative many, many times, more than you know, 70, 80% times. So our non-invasive saliva-based test is, uh, is, 
is going to avoid that need for biopsy because if it comes back negative, then you don't have to get the biopsy. If it comes back positive, then you do. So we were able to reach patients to yeah. see that they were excited about a non-invasive test through Colgate, right? And yeah. And what, what about the work that you did with uh, Cigna? Cigna and DentaQuest, both are insurance uh, uh, reimbursement, you know, provider benefits providers. And DentaQuest is a dental-based uh, benefits provider and Cigna is a dual medical dental. So with Cigna, we were able to uh, really deeply look into what are the barriers to getting reimbursed from the dental insurance for our test and what is the, what is the pathway of getting reimbursed for, for our test. So, you know, our test is a test which is a, a salivary detection test that is going to be mostly provided in the dentist office. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you would assume that the dental insurance would cover that, but the early detection of cancer really helps the medical insurance uh, provider because it helps the you know treatment early treatment reduced treatment costs and all that so yeah. we figured out that we could integrate dental medical insurance through Cigna uh, to say you know part of our test could be uh, covered by dental insurance and part of our test could be covered by medical insurance so exactly the conversation that we heard play out earlier in uh, our conversation today, which is uh, from Maria and Dr. Ginobili uh, speaking about, you know, where where does this lie? Is it dental? Is it medical? Is it through this collaboration? And for you, I think, and for Oris DX, this was sort of an aha moment, right? This was a pivot in the way that you were planning to go to market from what you had initially conceived of. Is that accurate? That is absolutely right. It it was through the experts at Dent Cigna. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we were you know, partnered with uh, the dental providers in Cigna, and we were also able to actually survey about 500 to 600 dentists to ask mm -hmm. for what they wanted as well. And they say they want a reimbursable test. And Cigna's internal uh, uh, experts were able to develop this pathway for us. And DentaQuest, I, I should mention that oh, too, DentaQuest is a dental insurance. Um, they helped us develop a pathway of how this test could be authorized in the dental clinic. What are the criteria that would be required for a dental insurance company to authorize a screening test for oral cancer or a diagnostic aid for oral cancer? So those are the things that you know we needed, but we really didn't have another pathway to get there and SMILE really, really accelerated our, our findings and our path forward to the go-to-market path. Amazing. Um, yeah. So for those uh, for those uh, startups listening, you know, some of the uh, outcomes in uh, uh, ORSDX was not alone, you know, surveys, data analysis, uh, kind of thought leader impacts were consistent themes among the benefits that many of the um, participating cohort companies received. Um, and uh, ORSTX was not the only company to have a pivot. So um, certainly I think it was very meaningful. Well, I know we have just a little bit of time and I do wanna reserve some, some opportunity for questions, but last thing for you, uh, Rafat, is you know, how, how are you continuing to benefit from the experience? I'll be really quick about that. The benefits have been huge. Not only do we continue to partner with Colgate and Cigna and Dentiquest, but the relationships that we've built with Matter and Kerkos Innovation Partners and the continued support that we're getting and the exposure to investors and talking with investors and actually being able to, you know, show the progress we've made and continue to make and bring in investor interests uh, has been huge. Well, um, uh, Rafat, we are thrilled to have you on today. Thank you for sharing some of your experiences. Um, I hope that that gave a, a day in the life, so to speak, to some of the innovators uh, on the line. Um, I'm going to take one last look. So if there's questions that anyone has in the audience, please uh, drop them into the Q&A and we will answer them. <clears throat> Perhaps Thanks, as, we, as we close out here, um, I, I, I wanted to highlight um, the important um, 
example and the work that ORSDS is doing and the involvement of impact from impact partners. Um, the three impact partners, as well as the remaining total of eight impact partners in last year's cohort, um, together jointly invested over $500,000 of in-kind services for those companies. And, and so I want to, first of all, extend my ex immense gratitude for the engagement and the meaningful impact of our partners. Um, and secondarily, I, I wanted to give a, a, a level of um, benchmark for the involvement that we expect, both from our partners and our, um, and our startups. Uh, once you are a small health company, you're forever part of the small health and matter alumni base. And so the, the work continues and maybe or, um, uh, Rifat, you could tell us a little bit about where you guys are going next after SMILE. Um, we have really moved forward with um, our go-to-market strategy. We are working with uh, building out our kit. We're working with uh, uh, data scientists to figure out what is the uh, economic benefit of the test. And we are talking to multiple investors to fund a clinical study. And we're designing our, our clinical study regulatory pathway to get FDA approval for this test eventually. So all of this was really facilitated by the work that we foundationally did with uh, SMILE and then have been moving forward on all fronts, regulatory strategy, FDA approval, reimbursement, uh, economic benefit, and obviously, you know, oral, uh, oral health based on dental medical integration. Amazing. Um, so a couple of final notes as we start to wind down our conversation here. Uh, if you look into the chat, we have uh, dropped the landing page for uh, the Smile Health program. If you're a startup, please apply. If you are uh, a partner, or an investor um, and you wanna learn more, there's, there's a button there for you as well. Um, we welcome all questions uh, that come through. Um, and I do see one other uh, question, which is just, are you looking for innovations and in services as well as devices? Yes, we're looking for innovation period. Um, you know, if you are a solution that's a software solution, if you are a process solution, a workflow solution, if you're a device, if you're a diagnostic, if you're uh, a wearable, really anything that I think helps to advance uh, the accessible, equitable, integrated uh, oral health solution set is what we're looking for from anywhere in the world. So with that, um, please join us in our mission. We're thrilled to have you and thank you for joining us today.